Hello everyone, welcome back to the 2020 Great Basin National Park Bio Blitz. My name is Amy Springer and I will be the instructor for this final video covering identification and ecology of hemipterans. And this video will cover part three of suborder Sternorhynchia and will include the last three families and superfamilies on our list of Sternorhynchians. To reorient you, under order Hemiptera, we have covered three families. Heteroptera was covered by Cody, Okanorhynchia was covered by me in the last three videos, and Sternorhynchia um, have been covered by me as well in these three videos. This is the last video of this series, and today I will be covering superfamily Coxoidea, which includes the scales and mealybugs, uh, family Adelgidae, which includes the uh, spruce and pine aphids, and finally Siloidea, which is the superfamily containing the jumping plant lice. So, starting with Coxoidea, the scales and mealybugs, this is a superfamily that contains some of the weirdest looking bugs that you will see in order Hemiptera. A few facts about their life history and key characteristics. Almost all of the adult female scales and mealybugs are wingless. Some of them don't even have legs. So in this case, while all Stanorhynchans are fairly sedentary, they don't move around a lot, Many female scales don't move at all because they are locked under a cap or sort of a scale over the top of their body and they don't have functioning legs or wings. So they're just plugged into a plant permanently. And this is one of the reasons why Sternorhynchans are called the parasitic hemipterans because they, unlike cicadas, or box elder bugs, or other common hemipterans you might see, they are stuck on their host plant. They are obligate parasites. They cannot get up and walk away. They are permanently affixed to that plant for their entire life. Um, another characteristic that's common in this superfamily is that almost all of them will have a waxy covering over their body. This is more common in mealybugs than in scales, but in general, these tend to be white, sort of moldy looking bugs. It's not mold, it's a wax that they produce to cover their exoskeleton. And uh, unlike scales, mealybugs, which you see in the picture here on the right, they can walk, it's kind of more of a crawl, but they are very, very slow. And most scales and mealybugs are soft-bodied and don't have wings. Like aphids, they are also often parthenogenic, meaning that they can clone themselves. So, for all of my other videos in this series, I've been using Herbie the Hemipterin, my little cartoon, to show you characters that will help you identify different families. But, I just can't do it for these guys because they're so weird. If you see something that looks kind of like a pill bug, but it has little spikes on the side, or you see something that looks kind of like a concentric ring of circles forming a tiny, tiny little barnacle on a plant, even though they look nothing like a hemipteran or like an insect, you may have found a coxoidian bug, a mealybug, or a scale. They just don't have a lot of characteristics going for them. I don't know how else to help you other than it. they look like blobs. If you find a blob, you might have found a scale or a mealybug. So I figured the best way to show you guys what you're looking for is just to give you a bunch of pictures of different scales and mealybugs. So on the right here, these are armored scales. The armored scales are a family of scales that produce a large plate over the top of their entire body. So the actual insect is underneath this little shell, and it is structured very similarly to what you'd see in a clam or in a barnacle or in a snail. 
these insects have a shell over the top of them, and they live their entire life underneath that shell. They don't really move at all, and so if you see a branch or a twig that has these little sort of pinky fingernail size uh, concentric circles that look like little tiny clams on it, those are probably armored scales. On the other hand, on the left here, these are some mealybugs. They're being tended by ants, which like to form a lot of sternorhynchins. And you can tell they've got some wax on them. You don't really see a lot of legs or antennae going on, no wings. But they can walk, unlike a lot of the scales. They can move if they try hard enough, just not fast. So again, with armored scales, they often look like little barnacles or oysters growing on leaves. If you peel them back, you can find the insect underneath. Um, they're a little bit hard, they're kind of stuck down to the leaf, but if you are ambitious, you can get it done and look at what's underneath them, which is pretty cool. Mealybugs will never have that hard shell type plate on top of their body, but they will almost always have uh, abundant waxy secretions that make them look kind of like little fuzzy uh, pill bugs that are walking around on leaves. And this is a mealybug, in fact the only mealybug I've ever found out in the field, and it shows this classic sort of white, moldy, segmented appearance. And a really cool thing about scales is one of these insects, unlike most sternorhynchins, which are considered pests in the human perspective, some of the soft scales, which don't have that hard plate on top, are actually a really important agricultural crop. So carmine is a popular red dye because it's all natural, it um, contains nothing harmful in it, and it's used in foods, cosmetics, fabrics, and in biological stains. So this is actually a common stain used in biology for being able to look at certain cell tissues under a microscope. And this dye is produced by crushing cochineal scale insects. So the cochineal bug is a scale that lives on mainly prickly pear cacti in Mexico and South America. And when you crush these scales, you can see on this person's hand here that they are blood red inside. And this pigment is a pigment they extract from cacti and sequester in their bodies. And it produces this lovely dark red dye called, if you look at the labels on some of the foods or some of the makeup you have at home, you may find it. It's called Cochineal Extract Crimson Lake, Carmine Lake, or Natural Red 4 on labels. So take a look at some of the things you have around your house. It doesn't technically count for this bio blitz as having found a hemipterin, but maybe you can find some crushed up and processed hemipterins in your food. I know that's probably not the most appealing thing to think about, but you know, it's, it's a really good dye and it's been used for hundreds of years. In fact, another species of scale that also produces a red pigment in Europe, in Spain and Italy, was used in medieval times to pay rent, because that's how popular and how coveted the dye was from these scales. So if you were a medieval person, you might go out and find a plant covered in this white fuzzy stuff and scrape it into a little tub to pay your rent for that month. So just a little bit of history there about some really cool scales. And I also just want to put this into perspective of how many scales are harvested each year by humans. So Peru alone exports over 850 tons of carmine each year. That is a lot of red dye. So again, take a look at your lipsticks, take a look at your ketchup, you might find this dye in it. Um, and it takes around 70,000 individual female scale bugs to produce a pound of dye. So if we calculate that out, this is all from the uh, Purdue Extension, um, that is 119 billion scale insects that are harvested each year in Peru alone. And these aren't usually farmed. This is people in tiny rural villages up in the mountains 
who go out into the wild, into the forests, into the fields, and find wild prickly pear cactus and hand harvest these scales. 119 billion of them. That's really impressive. So scales, while they are often plant pests, are also really cool. Second family for today, the adelgids, or the spruce aphids. Again, like we saw with the white flies, these are a misnomer. The adelgids are not aphids, they're adelgids, but they are called aphids because they look kind of similar. They do, however, live on spruce and pine. That part is true. A few facts about adelgids. As I mentioned, they are not aphids. They do not have cornicles. And they are characterized by having these really crazy, multi-generation, complex life cycles. Uh, some species will alternate between sexual reproduction between a male and a female. So one year, it will be males and females mating, and then they'll lay their eggs on a new host, not the host that they feed on, but a new host, and those eggs will hatch into parthenogenic or clonal offspring that will feed on that new host until they grow up, and then eventually they'll just sort of cycle back and forth between being uh, a sexual population that reproduces with males and females on one host, and an asexual population that reproduces via cloning on a different host. All of the adelgids feed exclusively on pine or spruce trees. They feed on conifers and nothing else. So this is a good family to identify by host. So go out and find a spruce tree, find a pine tree, and look for some white moldy fuzz on it. Odds are it's going to be an adelgid because they specialize on this group of trees. And many adelgids will also form galls on young stems. So look for um, enlarged areas on your spruce trees in your backyard or out in Great Basin um, and see if you can find any enlarged portions because you might find adelgids inside. Adelgids, other than being found on conifers, can also be identified by their highly reduced wing venation. So instead of having tons and tons of veins in their wings like many insects do, the adelgids have this big vein down at the bottom, and then three, and only three, vertical veins coming off of that. To take a look at an actual picture here, this, again, you can see there's a little bit of wax. It's that sort of little fuzzy white hairdo this adelgid has on his back and his head. And there's that one large vein running down the length of the wing, and three little vertical veins coming off of that. And as you can see, it's on a pine needle, also very um, characteristic for identification. And this is a gall. So this enlarged area of the stem, there are adelgids living inside this little uh, plant mansion, so to speak, that they have caused the plant to form. Insects do this in a number of ways. A lot of them are still being discovered. People are really doing a lot of research on how insects are able to cause plants to produce these structures, but basically they're hijacking the plant's genome and telling the plant, hey, make me a fancy home. I'd like to live inside here. And they're able to basically kidnap the plant's genome and make the plant do that for them. And that's what this gall is. If you break one open, this is what you might find inside. So all these little cells are basically little apartments for adelgids, and all of the little bugs you see inside are adelgid nymphs. So if you find a gall like that, cut it open. You might find something cool inside. No guarantees it's going to be a hemipteran, but you'll likely find an insect of some kind. And this is a scene that you might be able to find somewhere near you. These little, little white puff balls, those are all adelgids. And the final family for this series, uh, superfamily Siloidea, the jumping plant lice. This family is uh, a little bit unique in the Sternorhynchins because it's the only group that really does move well. They can jump. They don't fly very well, but they can actually, you know, walk. 
without great effort, unlike aphids or scales, which are pretty much stuck where they're at. They also have reduced wing venation, like the adelgids, but they have very long antennae, and they don't feed on pie trees. They feed on dicotyledons almost exclusively. So not grasses, not pine trees, but your typical flowers and um, broadleaf trees that you'll find in your yard and in Great Basin National Park. And like the adelgids, their nymphs often form galls or enlarged plant structures that are uh, developed to house and protect and feed insects. Their wings are a helpful diagnostic uh, clue, but they're not perfect. Uh, two things that are quite uh, noticeable in most psyllids is that this bottom vein here that I have highlighted with my top arrow is quite curved and forms a very large cell. And in that very large cell, there will be a crease. So if you can get your little insect to open its wings, you may be able to see that crease, and that's a sign that you may have found a psyllid. So here it is on a real insect. Again, we've got those long filamentous antennae that are diagnostic for all Cernorhynchans, and that big, uh, thick vein down at the front of that wing forming that large cell with a crease in the middle. And this is a picture of psyllid galls on hackberry trees. These are found throughout the U.S. and they, uh, I believe that these are called the hackberry nipple gall for those who are interested. And inside each of those little bumps on leaves there is one or more psyllids. And again they are hijacking this plant's genome and basically telling the plant's DNA to produce this tumor, basically, that they live inside and feed in. It's a very good home for a, a bug. They're completely protected inside of this. No bird's going to come up to these leaves and say, hmm, that's a tasty bug. I'll eat that. They're very well protected, so it's very beneficial to these insects. And finally, the last part of this series, a quick comparison. Are these both psyllid plant lice? I see some long filamentous antennae, I see some reduced wing venation, though on the picture on the right I do see that big first cell at the bottom of the wing, and on the left I do not. And the answer is, uh, if you could see closer, you'd notice that the insect on the left does not have a beak. This is a bark louse, and while they are really cool, and I have found them very, very rarely in the field, um, they are not psyllids. Psyllids are going to be much, much smaller. And as I mentioned, the bark louse is not a hemipteran, so it is not going to have a beak. So if you can get a look at the mouth, you'll be able to tell these two apart. And that's all I have for you today, so hope you enjoyed my lecture series on Okanarinka and Sternorinka, and hopefully I'll get to see you soon in our live videos. See you there.